Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Hopefully you can hear me okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is a recording for Hackensack's lecture for July 30th. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Hi everybody, my name is Alexis LaPietra. I'm an emergency medicine, pain management and addiction physician at St. Joseph's Health in Patterson, New Jersey. And today we're gonna talk about opioids, alternatives to opioids, and what you have in your toolbox to use for pain management. We all are very much aware that we are in a pain management dilemma, which is secondary to the opioid crisis. And of course, as physicians, providers, clinicians, our biggest concern is to make sure our patients are not suffering and we are not leaving them in pain. Traditionally, over the past 20 or 30 years, we've been rather reliant on opioids, especially when we see patients who are in severe pain because we know that opioids have a potential risk for misuse, addiction, and ultimately overdose death, we now are acutely aware that opioids cannot be our go-to for all pain. But we also know they are very, very important for severe pain, for pain where we absolutely need to mask what's going on and for patients who are suffering. So we don't want to, as a medical community, demonize opioids and say we just can't use them. But we really need to have a better understanding of when we should use them and what we need to talk to our patients about when we do have to prescribe or give a dose of opioids. But what else do we have really is the question. We want to get away from the pendulum swimming, swinging to opioids for everything. And of course we wanna avoid the pendulum swinging to opioids for nothing. So we're trying to find this balance. In 2021, we have a lot of evidence, we have a lot of support. And as a community in the medical field, we know that there needs to be a balance and we need to better understand which way we're going to go with opioids and just really understand the risks. It, it comes down to respecting opioids. When we think about medications that are harmful, they're all around us in medicine. So opioids are not a singular agent where, oh my gosh, we need to be really careful. There's tons of medications that we prescribe where we need to be really careful. We think about insulin. When that first hit the stage in the medical world, people were dying. It's very dangerous, but we've gained a respect. And we now understand what we need to say as clinicians and what we need to help patients understand. We know that when we give Coumadin or other anticoagulants, they're important. We don't want to say we can't use them, but we really do respect what happens when we start them. And this is where we need to go. This is the conversation that we need to have around opioids. We're going to use them. We need to use them. But now with all the evidence over the past 20 and 30 years about the significant risk when we do use them, we really need to make sure that we have a respect for what we're doing. And why? Why do we need to respect the opioids so much? And, and what is the big deal with the opioid? Well, the way that it works in the brain is it deposits in some of the centers of the brain that are linked to addiction. This can be something like the nucleus accumbens or the ventral tegmental area. These areas are linked to pleasure, desire, and reward. And when opioids bind in the brain, they cause a huge dopamine spike. And if you look here, these are not exact physiologic numbers, but it gives you an idea of what we're dealing with. So when you eat a really good meal, then you have a dopamine spike and that says to your brain, that was a good meal, we should probably eat that again. And again, when you're intimate, the body says, well, that was great, we should probably do that again. When you take an opioid, the dopamine spike is supra physiologic. So it's much higher than any of that pleasurable euphoric interactions that we have in our regular day-to-day -day life. And that significantly imprints on the brain the desire to go back for more because ultimately we are pleasure-seeking creatures and we want to go ahead and continue that euphoria and continue that pleasurable loop. So when we look at opioids, you just have to remember that of all the experiences we're gonna have as humans, that opioid can potentially imprint very pleasurable experience that says to the brain, let's do that again. And therein lies the potential for misuse, abuse, and addiction. So what do we do with that information? That information helps us to understand that this medication is important, but this medication also has some risks. So let's talk about everything else that we can use before we get 
to an opioid. And that one of those programs that we develop at St. Joseph's is called the ALTO program, or the Alternatives to Opioids program. And we started this in 2016 out of this very effort to look at a comprehensive pain management protocol that focused on opioid sparing strategies, understanding opioids were important, also understanding that opioid use disorder was prevalent, was increasing, and was very dangerous. So we were also keeping in mind the importance of medications for opioid use disorder, such as buprenorphine and methadone. And lastly, as part of the entire ALTO program, you have to think about harm reduction. You are certainly going to become in contact with patients who are using opioids, who are injecting opioids, and it's very important to have harm reduction conversations with that population, such as syringe access programs in your community, safe injection practices, and one of the easier pieces is naloxone kits. So take home naloxone kits at bare minimum naloxone prescriptions at discharge for patients who have opioid use disorder or patients who have received Narcan prior to seeing you. The ALTO program is built on kind of a tiered method. We're looking to chip away at the pain using a collection of medications. And as we combine different medications, we're gonna get a more robust response than if we just used one medication at a time. So when we think about the foundation of pain management, we're looking at really acetaminophen and NSAIDs. And I'm gonna show you some evidence in a little bit that shows you the combination of those two medications gives you pretty good pain management. If you just use one, it's okay. But if you use both together, you really get a bit more bang for your buck. We often forget another area of medications that you can give, which are topicals. So five or six years ago, when we started the Alto program, the topicals were relatively new, they were hard to get, and they were very expensive. But we've come a long way because the evidence is very robust on topicals being very effective and helpful, especially when you can't give by mouth anti-inflammatories. So a topical anti-inflammatory is a great way to get targeted anti-inflammatory relief, especially when patients come in with inflammatory pain like sprains or strains, without having to just be reliant on the by mouth NSAID. And that's important for patients who have history of GI bleed, peptic ulcer disease, or who are on anticoagulants. We want the benefit of inflammatory relief, but sometimes we just can't do it by a by mouth formulation. So the topical diclofenac gel, for example, is over the counter, works really well. And you can use that in combination with by mouth acetaminophen and together those medications work really well. Additionally, if you're doing by mouth NSAID and acetaminophen together, you can add even another layer with a topical local anesthetic like a lidocaine patch. This used to come in only a 5% prescription formulation, but now we have 4% over the counter. And the data does not show that the 4% is significantly worse. And honestly, it's much cheaper. It's easier to get. You don't need a prescription. So here we have already a first layer foundation of an NSAID, acetaminophen, and a topical lidocaine patch as three different medications, relatively safe, given together, really chip away at that low back pain, neck pain, and muscle sprains and strains. As we move up this kind of pyramid, we now talk about interventions. These are interventions that can be done in the ED, in the inpatient setting at bedside, or even in the office outpatient. So we're going to talk about trigger point injections, which are fantastic for tight, hyper irritable areas of muscle spasm. There's lots of soft tissue injections that can be performed, whether it's biceps tendonitis injection, knee injections for osteoarthritis or other arthritis pain, and other interventions around headache blocks that are very helpful that sometimes decrease the need at all for any other medications. And just that intervention alone really can get you where you need to go. And then we have nerve blocks. Classically, these are done perioperatively in the OR by anesthesia, but there's more and more evidence to support that they can be done in the ED as first-line treatment for a lot of significant pain where we used to only have opioids for this. But blocking pain takes away all of the pain, and that gives you much more pain relief than an opioid because you tend not to be able to get rid of all of the pain when you give an opioid for risk of making the patient apneic. And there's, of course, gaining evidence for non-pharmacological interventions, whether or not that's hands-on osteopathic manipulative therapy, acupuncture, aromatherapy, and lots of other different interventions that don't involve any medications at all. 
as you continue to go up, there's nitrous oxide for procedural pain management. We're going to talk about ketamine, gabapentin for neuropathic pain, and even things like dexmedetomidine or Presidex are actually starting to show there is some analgesic potential for these medications that we've been using. And then the last tier are opioids. And we need these opioids, but we must remember, this is not a targeted treatment. This is simply masking pain. So when we're talking about treatment, it's everything below that. So it's anti-inflammatory, it's injecting local anesthetic around an area that's irritated. But when we need to just mask pain, that's when we need to rely on the opioid. But we can always give the opioid in combination with the alternatives below it, again, for multimodal synergistic pain management. So when we think about a very common entity that we see, in, we see in the ER, we see in the outpatient setting, that's gonna be low back pain. So whether it's not, I slipped on the ice or I was trying to move a couch and folks come in and they really have a lot of pain. We used to typically say, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and give you some opioids, even sometimes a benzodiazepine with it, which is very dangerous, but we kind of thought that's all we had. Now we have a lot of evidence that shows you don't need to give opioids up front. Sometimes in patients who get opioids up front, they actually do a little bit worse. The opioids make you sleepy. They make you feel like you want to lay down. You're not up, you're not moving around. And what we find with low back pain is being up, being active and moving actually contributes to healing and reduced time frame for pain. So giving those opioids up front can actually harm the patient. We always have them to give as a second line. But if we only give them, that's the only thing we're trying, then we're not going to give the patient the advantage of trying to experience those alternatives if they work, and then sometimes just never needing exposure to opioids. And we know if you never take an opioid, you never have exposure to an opioid, you will never develop opioid use disorder. The more recent study that just came out in 2021 was great because it looked at all of the combinations that we typically give for musculoskeletal pain. So whether or not it's shoulder pain or neck pain or back pain or knee pain or hip pain, these are the combinations that we really most commonly reach for. So whether or not it's a lower dose of ibuprofen with acetaminophen, a higher dose with acetaminophen, the codeines, the hydrocodones or the oxycodones, all with that little bit of acetaminophen added to it, which actually doesn't do anything, but these are the combo products we reach for. What researchers found was out of all of these different combinations, Ibuprofen 400, acetaminophen 1000 was just as effective as everything else. So if you can give any of these and expect the same pain relief with any of these, why would you give opioids when we know that there is more risk potential with opioids, when we talk about misuse, addiction, potential, overdose death, than there is with the NSAIDs. We know that there are, of course, side effects with NSAIDs and with acetaminophen but comparatively, the opioids carry more risk. When we are going to discharge folks after we give them a dose in the emergency department or we give them a dose in the office, then what we wanna think about is that take-home regimen. And for that, the best combination for anti-inflammatory pain is going to be acetaminophen 1,000 three times a day with ibuprofen 400 milligrams three times a day. So we wanna give these medications I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my face out of the screen here, but I think you can see it. Ibuprofen 400 milligrams and acetaminophen 1,000 together. So tell folks, eat your breakfast, you take your 1,000 milligrams and your 400. At lunchtime, eat your lunch. Take your acetaminophen and your ibuprofen. At dinner time, after you eat, acetaminophen and ibuprofen. And we found that this combination three times a day is very helpful. Patients will say to you, my gosh, I'm gonna take two extra strength Tylenol and two ibuprofen, that's four tablets three times a day. Yes, because that has proven to be much more beneficial than one tablet of oxycodone with acetaminophen. So yes, I understand we're going from one tablet to four tablets, but that singular tablet does nothing to treat the pain. It doesn't target the pain at all. It simply masks the pain, makes the sleep be a little nauseous and constipated. And if we don't need to take it, we have a better alternative. Again, if the lidocaine patch can be used, you can use up to three patches at one time. You put them on for 12 hours, you take them off for the remainder of the day. If the NSAIDs are not an option, you have patients that said, listen, I cannot tolerate it. I have gastritis, I have an ulcer, whatever the reason, you have over-the-counter diclofenac gel, which you apply to the area of pain three times a day while you take your acetaminophen. 
And then we also need to talk about physical therapy for injuries. When you have that acute injury, usually physical therapy is very important in helping folks heal, understand better about body mechanics, how to prevent low back pain, how to lift heavy things. And this is very helpful in preventing additional injuries. A trigger point injection is a skilled bedside procedure that can be performed by really any physician. It is very important when you're doing a physical exam for musculoskeletal pain, especially of the neck, thoracic, or low back, to spend a little extra time finding out if that area of pain, that muscular spasm, has a component of a hyperirritable knot. And all of us have felt this. If you sleep funny or you exercise or you fell and you are feeling that sore area and you feel that lumpy, bumpy focal area of spasm. And when you touch it, it really hurts. You say, oh my gosh, that, that fully reproduces my pain. That could be a trigger point. And you can see here, it's this tight, tight area of muscle spasm. It's very hard to treat with all the other things I talked about because the medications don't really penetrate into that tight muscle spasm. And for this problem, the best thing to do is to put a tiny little needle into the muscle spasm. It forces the muscle to twitch and relax and resolve a lot of the trigger point pain. And trigger points are part of myofascial pain syndrome. So we're gonna see this in acute injuries, and we can also see this in folks with chronic musculoskeletal issues. The equipment you need to treat this is equipment you have in the office or the ED or the acute care setting. You're looking for a needle that is long enough to get into the trigger point. So it could be a superficial cervical, you know, neck trigger point. It could be a deeper lumbar trigger point but you need to get the needle into the trigger point to engage the muscle fibers and force it to relax. And of course we wanna use the smallest lumen possible. So we don't need to do a fine needle biopsy when we're doing our trigger point injection, but you do have to take a look at how deep you think that muscle spasm is and how long of a needle you need. The next thing you need is some local anesthetic. The whole point of this procedure is to use the needle to break up the muscle spasm, but you just stabbed your patient with the needle I know it's to help them, but they do have now a different type of pain, which is related to the muscular injection. So when we're looking at this procedure over time, the research has shown the best thing to do after you do the dry needling is inject a little bit of local anesthetic. It masks the pain that you caused while you're treating the muscle spasm, and then holistically the patient feels better. Their myofascial pain is handled, their injection pain that you caused is handled, and they're able to go home without any pain. So the crux of this procedure, which of course I recommend looking up and practicing is you find that muscle spasm, you pinch the muscle spasm, you place the needle into the muscle at a 30 degree angle. You come almost all the way out, you redirect in, almost all the way out, redirect in, and you do this a couple times. The goal is you wanna move the needle in and out of the knot, which breaks up the spasm. And after you've done that just a few times, you can deposit a very low volume of local anesthetic, you can rub that local anesthetic in, put a Band-Aid on, and you're done. This procedure is a billable procedure. So you're spending time at the bedside, you're performing a skilled advanced pain management technique, and what's nice about that is you're generating revenue. And anytime we're spending time at the bedside and we're performing a procedure, the revenue associated with it is helpful because that's, you know, we all have to eat, we all have to get paid. And this is a great way to provide quality pain management. And then of course, you're able to be compensated for that time you've spent. The nerve block history ultimately lies in anesthesia. Again, as I mentioned earlier, has typically been the practitioners that perform nerve blocks and they're done before the OR or after the OR. But in 2021, we've had a lot of research and a lot of history for emergency medicine practitioners doing this downstairs when patients arrive and having fantastic results. So the American College of Emergency Physicians just released in April 2021 a policy statement saying ultrasound guided nerve blocks are not only within the scope of emergency medicine physicians to perform, but they actually represent a core component of this multimodal pathway when we're trying to control pain in patients who have significant injuries. So when we look at patients presenting to the emergency department, what is the best way to handle this severe pain? If you can block that pain, we need to block, block, block it, because that is the best way to get that pain down to the lowest pain score we can without the harm of apnea, which we might see with opioids. Any hip fracture, 
we really need to be thinking about a femoral nerve block or a fascia iliaca compartment block. This has been shown to be the best intervention for pain, especially for geriatric patients. It provides long lasting, very, um, what's the word I wanna say, reliable pain relief. You can really be, you can rely that that local anesthetic is gonna work. You don't have to think, is this dose of opioid okay? I'm gonna have to go back, give a little more opioid. I don't want, you know, the patient to stop breathing. I don't wanna be worrying about the blood pressure. So geriatric hip fracture, best intervention, nerve block. When we think about rib fractures, we know they're such painful conditions. We know we don't have a great way to treat them, but doing a serratus anterior block or an erector spinae block breaks the crisis, brings the pain all the way down to zero. And then it's much easier to have a maintenance pain regimen. When you have a patient with rib fractures and their pain score is 10 out of 10, really no matter what you're doing, you're already behind the eight ball because you're starting with such a high pain issue. But if you get that pain broken, that cycle broken, and you're down at a zero, then your NSAIDs and your acetaminophen and your topical local anesthetics, you're starting from a much better place. The patient has significant pain relief, and now we can layer those pain medications on, and we're not trying to catch up to a 10 out of 10 pain. Any abdominal trauma, the transversus abdominis plane block is relatively easy to perform and it covers the entire abdominal wall, really actually mostly from the umbilicus down, but when we have lower abdominal trauma or we have abdominal wounds, abdominal abscesses that need drainage, uh, any wound care from burns, this provides beautiful coverage of the sensory um, intervention for the abdominal wall, and you can really prevent sometimes pr procedural sedation or need for opioids as well. And lastly, anything below the knee, a popliteal block. Again, it's a relatively superficial block performed in the popliteal fossa, and it really should, in your mind, you think it's a below the knee amputation distribution. So below the knee, if you think about when an amputation is performed, that whole distribution of lower extremity is taken care of with a popliteal block. So anything below the knee down to the foot, you're getting 90% coverage with a popliteal block. Some more blocks that we can do now when we talk more about the upper half of the body, we have headache blocks. And there's the occipital block, the lower power cervical block, and something super easy called a sphenopalatine ganglion block, which is really atomized local anesthetic into the nasopharynx. It winds down the autonomic dysregulation associated with headache. There's no needles involved, very easy to perform. And then when we think upper extremities, there's a supraclavicular block, which really will get most of the entire upper extremity. And then we have more specific blocks of the forearm, the median, the ulnar, and the radial, and that takes care of really the wrist, the fingers, and a lot of the forearm. So when you have fractures, when you have nerve repair, I'm sorry, when you have laceration repair, and you need to just get good coverage of that forearm, you have these blocks to perform as well. And we're going to talk about ketamine now. So this is an NMDA receptor antagonist, and we've been using this in emergency medicine and acute care for a long time. So this is not an office intervention, but this is really an ED intervention. And this is a wonderful medication for severe pain, especially if you have patients who have opioid use disorder or who are on opioids daily for chronic pain. Their mu opioid receptors, whether or not it's illicit opioids or it's prescription opioids, are saturated if they're using opioids every day. So we need another receptor to handle our severe pain. And that receptor is the NMDA receptor. Ketamine binds to it, it stops the neuro excitation, the wind up phenomenon, it kind of just calms down the brain that is very agitated from severe pain. And if patients are going to require opioids, if you give ketamine first, you're gonna need less opioids, sometimes no opioids, that's a huge benefit. When given in subdissociative analgesic low doses, like the 0 0.15 to 0 0.3, milligrams per kilogram, you have no vital sign abnormalities. So this is not ketamine for procedural sedation where we're giving one to two milligrams per kilogram. We're giving significantly less. We do not need full cardiopulmonary monitoring and we will see no vital sign changes at this dose. If you don't wanna worry about weight-based dosing, then most adults can get a 20 milligram dose over 10 minutes on the pump and do just fine. We don't advocate for pushing ketamine because if you do that, ketamine is associated with dysphoria. Patients get a little agitated. They feel kind of like they're in a dreamlike state. But if you do it over 10 minutes, those 
side effects are not seen as commonly. And because ketamine has a relatively short half-life, if you have folks that are in pain and they're gonna be with you for a little while, you can then put them on a continuous infusion of a very low dose, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram per hour. And that way you're getting a nice steady state of pain relief while you're doing the rest of their workup. So here's kind of a snapshot of the medication and interventions that are available to you all of which we talked about. I'm gonna briefly talk about gabapentin. We had some great evidence for gabapentin a couple of years ago. We're getting a little bit more now that it may not be the silver bullet we thought for all neuropathic pain, but it is certainly very, very helpful for post herpetic neuralgia, some of the diabetic neuropathies. When you're giving it in the emergency department, if you have a frail, elderly patient, a fall risk patient, give about 100 milligrams to them right there in the ED. If you have a non-frail patient, no fall risk, you can give 300 milligrams. That's really an analgesic dose for the patient, along with the other medications you're giving. When you discharge the patient, you can give them the dose you gave them in the ER at night. So 100 milligrams, QHS at night, and then you leave it up to primary care physician, neurology, or though whoever they're going to see, they can titrate that medication because it will need to be higher than the 100 milligrams or the 300 milligrams, but at least a dose in the ED gets you started when you're encountering patients with neuropathic pain. I want to just wrap up talking about opioids because we're going to have to use them. And although you have all of these alternatives, this huge toolbox, all these options in your armamentarium for pain, there are certainly going to be the countless patients over your career that you need to use opioids on. So I want to talk about maybe is there a better opioid to use? When we talk about opioids by mouth, our classic opioid, especially in New Jersey, is oxycodone. It is the most commonly prescribed. It is the most commonly abused. It is the most desirable when folks take it versus other opioids. And it causes the most, I apologize for my misspelling there, the most euphoria. It deposits in the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area, those addiction centers more heavily than other opioids. And when we talk about a dopamine spike, it has a really big dopamine spike. So in comparison to all the opioids out there, oxycodone by mouth is really, it's a little problematic because it causes a huge euphoria. It's got a lot of addiction potential. And because we give it so much, there's a lot of it out in the community. It's frequently diverted and folks want it. If you're gonna use an opioid and you're looking to, to get that euphoria, you're looking for oxycodone. So as more and more studies come out, in 2021 about likability, we do need to say, okay, maybe oxycodone is not our best medication when we're thinking about a by mouth opioid. Hydromorphone or dilaudid, by mouth tends not to be as euphoric, tends not to be as desirable, and folks are not really diverting it as much. But intravenous, when you push hydromorphone, it has a very, very, very large, one of the highest dopamine spikes. And when you give IV dilaudid to folks who are used to getting IV heroin, the IV heroin users cannot tell the difference between IV dilaudid and IV heroin when you blind them. So we don't need to pull dilaudid off all the formularies, but we do need to think for opiate naive patients, if we're pushing hydromorphone and it is as euphoric as IV heroin, then maybe we should be thinking about using simply IV morphine for most of our pain. If you have opioid tolerant patients, hydromorphone is a more potent IV opioid and sometimes we do need to reach for it. Morphine sulfate immediate release, which is simply just morphine PO, is probably going to be gaining more popularity as our opioid of choice by mouth and for discharge simply because it works really well. It's just not as euphoric it doesn't have as much addiction potential. And when folks are in pain and you give them oxycodone and they have pain again, and you give them morphine, they rate the desirability to take it again and the likability much higher with oxycodone. So people want more oxycodone. They wanna come back to oxycodone, but the morphine does just as good a job for their pain. It just doesn't have that follow-up of, I'd like to take that again. I think I wanna seek that out. And that was really pleasurable. So it is less euphoric and it is just as effective. I'm going to talk about dose as well. I want to also briefly mention tramadol. The bottom line on tramadol is we do not use it. We should not use it. If folks come into the hospital on tramadol, they take it every day. It's the opioid that they've been prescribed for their chronic pain. That's different. 
But in opiate naive patients, we should not be starting tramadol thinking it's the bridge between our alternatives and you know that big bad wolf of oxycodone. No, it has all of the harms associated with opioids and more. And it's not saving us any opioid exposure at all. So you have your ibuprofen, your acetaminophen, and your topicals and your non-farm. And if you need to go somewhere else, you need to escalate. I would escalate to morphine by mouth. I would not think, oh, tramadol somewhere in between, and I'm not going to, you know, expose them to as much opioid. It'll have less addiction potential. That is just not true. Tramadol agonizes the mu receptor, has as much addiction potential, and then it also is serotonergic. So it has serotonin peaks as well. If patients are on serotonergic agents, then you have combination of serotonin peaks and you can lead to serotonin syndrome. So just to talk about all the harms, and there's quite a few, because I'm going to try to convince you here, tramadol can lead to seizure with the very first dose you take it, or even if you've been taking it for five years. New onset seizure, we see an increase in patients who are taking tramadol. Long-term tramadol use is increased, um, I'm sorry, is associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And we know any long-term use, opioid long-term use, and said long-term use, there's harms associated with both of those. So anything that you're taking every single day for multiple years, there's issues with. But if you're taking tramadol every single day for multiple years, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are in there. Serotonin syndrome, like I mentioned, and then varying metabolism. Some patients metabolize tramadol very, very quickly, and they can actually have almost an overdose picture. Some folks metabolize tramadol super slow, and they have no effect at all. And they'll tell you, doc, this doesn't work for me. And then there's the other third of the population that does just fine. But we have no idea how our patient is gonna metabolize tramadol when we prescribe it. And we would never prescribe something where we have a 30% chance that it'll work. So if, if you're in the you know, numbers game here, this is not a good medication to give. You have an unknown amount of serotonin, serotonin that's gonna be released and an unknown amount of opioid that's gonna be released and metabolized. So it's kind of an unpredictable, not very safe medication. You can still get respiratory depression, just like other full agonists. There's multiple drug-drug interactions. 50% of patients who are on tramadol with diabetes end up with hypoglycemia that requires hospitalization. There's increased chance of needing hospitalization secondary to hyponatremia in patients who take tramadol. And again, there is a more there's more mortality risk when you take tramadol long-term than compared to taking NSAIDs long-term. So no tramadol, but you know, what do I give now? You told me all about the alternatives. You told me I can't give oxycodone. So what do I give? If you can't give morphine right now and morphine's just not within the muscle memory of your institution and you're really stuck with oxycodone for right now, I would advocate that you give a lower dose of oxycodone, a 2.5. When you prescribe it, tell them to break it in half and you've add those alternatives to it. Oxycodone 2.5, acetaminophen 1,000, and Motrin 400. I know it's three pills, but you're gonna get so much better pain relief than just giving that Percocet five. Morphine IR, morphine sulfate immediate release. This is a PO morphine. You would give 10 milligrams. Some, you know, morphine can be given up to 15 or 30 milligrams, but really the equal analgesic dose to oxycodone five is gonna be 10. And that is a common formulation in outpatient pharmacies. So for a less euphoric, potentially less addictive potential opioid, morphine 10 by mouth, Give it with your alternatives, acetaminophen 1,000, ibuprofen 400, and you are going to do a really good job for patients who have severe pain and need the opioid. Understand that we give a ton of oxycodone and Percocet, so some pharmacies may not have it immediately available, but I am finding that most pharmacies in our area do carry it. In patients who have renal dysfunction, significant renal dysfunction, morphine is not a great option because the metabolites accumulate and you can have issues and understand that morphine really lost favor because it causes some itching. So 24% of patients are going to have itching, whereas oxycodone patients don't really have itching. If itching is our biggest worry about opioids, we're doing great. So just know, you know, if patients say, oh, doc, but I have so much itching. Well, better than opioid use disorder for sure. So let's just sum up with best practice. 
we really need to use the lowest effective dose of opioids possible, the lowest euphoric potential opioids whenever we can, and then we need to counsel. We need to say to our patients, I am giving you something that is harmful. I understand there's harm associated with it, but you're in severe pain and I think you need it. So you're gonna take as few doses as possible and you're not gonna take it for, you know, you're only gonna take for as many days as you need it. You're gonna have close follow-up. And if you feel like you're taking it, even when you don't have pain or you're taking it because you just like the way it makes you feel and not really because of your pain, we need to know because that may be the beginnings of addiction. Our patients need to know this. This is how we're gonna stop the opioid crisis is we're gonna stop patients from continuing to take opioids and we're gonna empower them to know the red flags. You also need to check the prescription monitoring database because sometimes folks, unfortunately, they go hospital to hospital or doc to doc to get opioids to abuse or divert. And we need to know that. We need to be aware of what's going on with our patients. The shortest course possible is always best. And we just probably need to see these patients sooner than two weeks. We need to maybe see them in five days, see them in seven days and get an idea of how their pain is. Please do not use silly oxycodone five slash acetaminophen 325, the 325 does nothing. And if you want them to take that full analgesic dose of acetaminophen, they're gonna have to do math and that's obnoxious. So if you're gonna give an opioid, it's gonna be oxycodone five, morphine 10, and then give full analgesic dosing of your ibuprofen and your acetaminophen. Please don't use tramadol, just don't. Just take it away out of your mind and don't use tramadol. Think about trigger point injections, ultrasound guided nerve blocks, all of those headache, headache blocks we talked about, all of the non-pharmacological interventions start there because you always have opioids as a second line. And then again, just to talk about in 2021 with likability studies, should we be looking at more morphine as opposed to oxycodone as our norm? And that's pretty much it. That's all I have to talk to you guys about, about alternatives, opioids, and the toolbox you have. This is my email. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have or help you with any protocols that you'd like to build. And it's really been a pleasure talking to you guys today. So thank you.